So I want to talk to you today about the future of our species and really the future of life. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Within a century or two, Earth will be dominated by entities that are more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals or from chimpanzees. Because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. These will be the main products of the economy, of the 21st century economy. Not textiles and vehicles and weapons, but bodies and brains and minds. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Those who control the data control the future, not just of humanity, but the future of life itself. Because today, data is the most important asset in the world. In ancient times, land was the most important asset. And if too much land became concentrated in too few hands, humanity split into aristocrats and commoners. Then in the modern age, in the last two centuries, machinery replaced land as the most important asset. And if too many of the machines became concentrated in too few hands, humanity split into classes, into capitalists and proletariats. Now data is replacing machinery as the most important asset. And if too much of the data becomes concentrated in too few hands, humanity will split not into classes, it will split into species, into different species. Now why is data so important? It's important because we've reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. There is a lot of talk these days about hacking computers and email accounts and bank accounts and mobile phones, but actually we are gaining the ability to hack human beings. Now what do you need in order to hack a human being? You need two things. You need a lot of computing power and you need a lot of data, especially biometric data. Not data about what I buy or where I go, but data about what is happening inside my body and inside my brain. Until today, nobody had the necessary computing power and the necessary data to hack humanity. Even if the Soviet KGB or the Spanish Inquisition followed you around everywhere, 24 hours a day, watching everything you do, listening to everything you say. Still, they didn't have the computing power and the biological knowledge necessary to make sense of what was happening inside your body and brain and to understand how you feel and what you think and what you want. But this is now changing because of two simultaneous revolutions. On the one hand, advances in computer science, and especially the rise of machine learning and AI, are giving us the necessary computing power. And at the same time, advances in biology, and especially in brain science, are giving us the necessary understanding, biological understanding. You can really summarize 150 years of biological research since Charles Darwin in three words. Organisms are algorithms. And we are learning how to decipher these algorithms. Now, when the two revolutions merge, when the infotech revolution merges with the biotech revolution, what you get is the ability to hack human beings. And maybe the most important invention for the merger of infotech and biotech is the biometric sensor that 
translates biochemical processes in the body and the brain into electronic signals that a computer can store and analyze. And once you have enough such biometric information and enough computing power, you can create algorithms that know me better than I know myself. As you surf the internet, as you watch videos or check your social feed, the algorithms will be monitoring your eye movements, your blood pressure, your brain activity, and they will know. They could tell Coca-Cola that if you want to sell this person some fuzzy, sugary drink, don't use the advertisement with the shirtless girl. Use the advertisement with the shirtless guy. You wouldn't even know that this was happening, but they will know, and this information will be worth billions. Propaganda por todos os lados, personalizada para você e até de acordo com o seu humor. No filme de ficção científica Minority Report, isso faz parte do cotidiano. Mas não é ficção e sim realidade. O método que consegue ler os consumidores para a indústria da publicidade já existe e se chama Emotional Decoding. A empresa londrina Real Eyes analisa como os clientes reagem às propagandas para marcas como Coca-Cola e Adidas. O software registra os mínimos movimentos no rosto e assim reconhece emoções como surpresa ou alegria. As emoções são muito complexas e nós, humanos, não conseguimos reconhecer todas. Computadores logo vão fazer isso melhor que a gente, porque eles têm mais capacidade de cálculo do que um cérebro. Uma empresa de TI estimou que até 2025 os aparelhos vão saber mais sobre o estado de espírito de uma pessoa do que a própria família dela. Real Eyes usa inteligência artificial para analisar expressões faciais. Os pesquisadores mostram vídeos para voluntários no próprio laptop e smartphone deles. A câmera grava cada detalhe do rosto. O software pode mostrar exatamente em que segundo aconteceu a reação à imagem. A nossa expressão mostra muito sobre o nosso estado de espírito, sobre nossas emoções. Com o Emotional Decoding, nós podemos descobrir, por exemplo, qual a intenção da pessoa e como ela reage a coisas, como uma publicidade. É preciso tomar cuidado, porque você fica muito transparente. Essa tecnologia acaba revelando coisas sobre você que você não revelaria de forma voluntária. E ninguém quer que uma máquina saiba essas coisas. Então é preciso ser cuidadoso e ver como esses algoritmos estão sendo usados e se isso está acontecendo com consentimento ou não. Once we have algorithms that can understand me better than I understand myself, they could predict my desires, manipulate my emotions and even take decisions on my behalf. And if we are not careful, the outcome might be the rise of digital dictatorships. In the 20th century, democracy generally outperformed dictatorship because democracy was better at processing data and making decisions. We are used to thinking about democracy and dictatorship in ethical or political terms, but actually, These are two different methods to process information. Democracy processes information in a distributed way. It distributes the information and the power to make decisions between many institutions and individuals. Dictatorship, on the other hand, concentrates all the information and power in one place. Now, given the technological conditions of the 20th century, distributed data processing worked better than centralized data processing, which is one of the main reasons why democracy outperformed dictatorship and why, for example, the US economy outperformed the Soviet economy. But this is true only under the unique technological conditions of the 20th century. In the 21st century, 
new technological revolutions, especially AI and machine learning, might swing the pendulum in the opposite direction. They might make centralized data processing far more efficient than distributed data processing. And if democracy cannot adapt to these new conditions, then humans will come to live under the rule of digital dictatorships. And already at present, we are seeing the formation of more and more sophisticated surveillance regimes throughout the world, not just by authoritarian regimes, but also by democratic governments. The US, for example, is building a global surveillance system, while my home country of Israel is trying to build a total surveillance regime in the West Bank. But control of data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. And if indeed we succeed in hacking and engineering life, this will be not just the greatest revolution in the history of humanity, this will be the greatest revolution in biology since the very beginning of life four billion years ago. For four billion years, nothing fundamental changed in the basic rules of the game of life. All of life for four billion years, dinosaurs, amoebas, tomatoes, humans, all of life was subject to the laws of natural selection and to the laws of organic biochemistry. But this is now about to change. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. And at the same time, science may enable life after being confined to, for four billion years to the limited realm of organic compounds, science may ena enable life to break out into the inorganic realm. So after four billion years of organic life shaped by natural selection, we are entering the era of inorganic life shaped by intelligent design. This is why the ownership of data is so important. If we don't regulate it, a tiny elite may come to control not just the future of human societies, but the shape of life forms in the future. 